I know, you just can't quit this series, can you? It's alright, I can't either. That's why I'm wasting my life doing videos on it. Today marks a clear shift, where this will be new territory for anime-only viewers. For about a month until Season 3 comes out, where Mine's Long Winter and Subsequent Journey for Spring Prayer finally begins. Yeah, this entire video, with a big asterisk, will be spoilers for anime-only viewers. So keep that in mind before going further. Still watching? Good. I'll take that as your consent for being spoiled on events. Hell, if you're that dedicated, why not subscribe too? With those two obligatory things out of the way, let's go ahead and get into part two, volume three. I mentioned a big asterisk for anime-only viewers, and that's right off the bat. The prologue of this volume is from Cardstat, the knight from last volume's point of view. He's relaxing at his home in the Noble Quarter when his attendant tells him his visitor, Ferdinand, has arrived. We meet his wife, Elvira, and his eldest son, Eckhard, who's eagerly chatting with Ferdinand while he waits for Cardstat. He does remark how nice it is that his family is among the few nobles who still view Ferdinand favorably, and that's an understatement, but they leave and let the two get down to business. Cardstead asked Ferdinand to come to his house rather than the castle, only adding to the list of blink and you'll miss it clues about who the hell Ferdinand actually is, due to Sheiks's mother raising a stink over her son being punished for getting mine hurt. Apparently she even cried in front of Lady Veronica, which is a name we don't recognize nor will we be familiar with for a few volumes yet. But hey, that's how you build continuity. Ferdinand is already aware of her moaning though, since the bishop isn't exactly keeping quiet about it either. But we recap the events of the Trombe extermination from Cardstead's point of view, where it wasn't just mine getting hurt, but a massive failure in principle on the Knight's Order as a whole. Damuel and Sheiksa were assigned to guard mine, and they hurt her instead. That reflects poorly on them and the Order. Ferdinand is glad that Cardstat returned the magic tool he used on mine in his place, since it meant not meeting with Veronica in person. Cardstat asks Ferdinand about mine, if she is indeed a threat to the duchy, but he replies that she isn't. Her head is filled with nothing but books, but more troubling is that she has memories of living as a noble in a past life. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there. Quit typing that comment. That's from his perspective. Cardstep finds that interesting, sure, but he's more interested in how animated Ferdinand is about mine, since he no longer looks like a dude who gave up on life. He points out how much he's taken a liking to her, but Ferdinand shuts that down by saying she's just that valuable. By showing how much mana she has, rumors are already spreading in the noble quarter, so Ferdinand asks Cardstep to adopt mine. He's willing to, but he does point out that there's someone Ferdinand should probably ask first making him ask why the hell everybody has to be so damn difficult. Over to mine, she's still reveling over how vivid that magic tool made her memories again. Also, she really appreciates her Earth Mother now, which will be relevant in coming events. But Lutz snaps her back to reality, telling her that they've printed enough for 80 books. Sensing trouble already, Mine says they should probably make a new guild for bookmaking as they just revolutionized an industry overnight, as workshops will soon just make books. She says she'll talk to Benno about it, but she's starting to worry about his workload with how many industries she's making him dip his toes into. Lutz tells her that she shouldn't worry though. Benno's only as busy as he wants to be, and it's not a problem unless Mark steps in. So she meets Benno and he yells at her immediately because he got summons from an archnoble out of nowhere to make her new ceremonial robes. What the hell? Now, she can't really go into details why because it deals with the Knight's Order, plus she forgot since she was bedridden anyway. It's still a net positive though. Benno's gonna take that connection he just made with an Archnoble. Why wouldn't he? He asks that since she's not there for her robes, what the hell is she there for? And she talks to him about setting up a printing guild. They'll need some examples to show what the hell they're gonna make, so he tells Lutz to go fetch the Bibles they have at the temple. But mine asks if this'll just make more work for him. It all depends on how many books she makes to sell, and mine realizes Bibles are probably the right choice here, since magic requires the gods names to cast. So those will be ideal to sell to noble children as study material. Oh yeah, plus merchants will need to know them to greet noble customers, so rich people will want them too. Well that's a smart move. When Lutz comes back, they head off to the merchants guild to file paperwork, and circle back on the whole salting animal fats to make candles smell less. And Benno suggests selling that method to the candle workshops, as even rich people use a fat and wax mixture for their candles. At the guild, they bump into Frida for what feels like the first time in forever, and they talk about how the pound cake is doing. It's selling well among nobles, and it's weird how relevant that is for the foreseeable future. She eventually asks Mine what she's up to. Yeah, it comes back to Frida wants to spend some time with Mine, but Mine's busy. 
and that leads into the new guild they're starting. So Mime pitches the new book she made. Frida sees it, and since she's struggling to learn the gods' names, she buys one for one small gold and eight large silvers. Where Mime sold the 20 Bibles they made already for one small gold and five large silvers to Benno. Yeah, she made three large gold coins that day. Frida asks Mine if she can make a book on the subordinate gods of each of the Eternal Five. Wow, have I really not touched on the religion of this world? Okay, so the mythology is pretty well thought out, I'll give it that. There's the king and queen, the god of darkness and goddess of light. Their children are the goddesses of water, wind, and earth, as well as the god of fire. Then there's the god of life, who married the god of earth, and that makes, like, the second tier of gods. That's the Eternal Five that they keep talking about. And each of those gods have a subordinate twelve under them, the so-called exalted twelve of each god. And this is where the other gods like Mestinor, the goddess of wisdom, and Angrief, the god of war, come in. The initial Bible mine made covers the main gods, the king and queen, and the eternal five. But covering the twelve subordinates of each of the eternal five? Yeah, mine's got quite a few more books to make. That'll be good for business. After she sold one to Frida, Mine, Lutz, and Benno head out. But they get called after by someone on the busy second floor. Someone yelling for the Gilberta Company girl, which Mine assumes is Corina. Benno pushes outside, saying they'll follow if it's important. And it turns out it's the trusty smithy she's been using, Johan. He begs Mine to become his patron, and things get awkward. They move to Benno's office, where they have to set some things straight. One, Johan, being a Smith Hurl coming of age, has to pass a test where he makes a product for a patron, gets their approval, and is thus approved by the guild or else his contract is voided. Now he wants mine because he assumes that she's Benno's daughter. They have to tell him that she's not, and she's not even an apprentice there. It's explained that she's the forewoman of her own workshop, and Benno is just her financial guardian. Mine likes Johan's work, but he has trouble getting other clients because he's too detail-oriented, and annoys people with questions. Since she's not Benno's daughter and is underage, Johan's depressed he won't get a patron and will lose his job. But mine just came into a small fortune recently, and she has a very technical piece of metalwork she needs done. Benno gives his approval and cosigns, which Johan thinks is risky, but Benno assures him that whatever mine's about to ask for, she's got the money to cover it. So she wants him to make a set of metal letter types for a printing press. It's going to be incredibly technical and a real pain in the ass over winter. Which makes Benno laugh, because Johan should have realized there was a catch to mine being his patron somewhere. She finished the blueprints that day and handed them over the next. As autumn is ending, meaning we had a bit of a time skip, Lutz tells Mine the ink guild master and a foreman stopped by Benno's store asking about the new ink because they noticed it hitting the market. Mine realizes it's probably a situation similar to the parchment guild, but Lutz tells her to go see Benno the next day. She does, and he confirms her plan to sell them the method, with the stipulation that she can still make her own, so they hammer out a price. It's a diminishing pricing plan, where it's 30% for 10 years, then 20, and then down to 10 for all time, with the guild as the signing party rather than the current head, so it's honored when they die. Now they're using a magic contract here, because it's a big sum of money, but also Benno doesn't trust the Ink Guild Master, so after hammering out Mine's wishes, the Ink Guild arrives. But Benno sends Mine upstairs to Karina to hide while they do the actual negotiations, because he doesn't want them to know what she looks like. While up there with Karina, she's fitted for her new robes. Oto casually drops that Benno's been training him to take over the Gilberta company, and after a bit, Lutz and Mark come in for Mine to sign the contract and get pricked. The terms are exactly what Mine and Benno agreed upon. It burns up as a magic contract does, and then they leave. Before they do though, Lutz does tell Mine what the Ink Guild head was like. A scary dude who said he knew about a kid asking about ink right before this stuff hit the market. And a bit later still, Benno comes racing upstairs and tells Mine Mark is going to get her dad to take her home. Because Lutz got cornered by a group of guys asking about the Gilberta Company girl. Meaning they're from the Ink Guild most likely. It's weird that they waited until after the contract was signed though, because information gathering usually happens before that. Though the audience knows at this point that nobles are interested in Mine. And uh... The Ink Guild has deep connections with nobles. When Gunther and Thule arrive, Benno suggests that they take her to the temple now. They're opposed, but mine will for sure be more safe there, since no one can just walk in without business. Plus, as far as commoners know, there's nobles there, and no commoner wants to be around nobles. Now Gunther tries to put his foot down, but asks Mime what she wants, and she reluctantly says that she'll go to the temple so her family and Lutz can be safe. Gunther and Thule immediately take Mime to the temple, where Fran is surprised to see her. But before he gets her inside her room and comfortable, she explains the situation because she doesn't want Delia to hear. Yeah, that's kind of a running theme in this volume. 
Just a reminder that Delia is in fact a spy for the High Bishop. The head of the Ink Guild is targeting her, he's a shady dude who's rumored to do criminal activities to get in better with nobles, and that means the High Bishop might have connections to him as well, so it's best he doesn't know the situation. Her family drops her off, but promises to visit her over her long winter stay, and mine gets her first real glimpse at her attendants' lives, since it's right before dinner, and uh, it's about what you'd expect. Rosina is playing the Harspiel, Deli is getting hot water for a long bath, Gil and Fran are doing paperwork, so mine decides to just get her letter to the high priest written. But uh, that doesn't really take long. She starts her new subordinate god's bible that Frida mentioned, gets a fancy meal, bathes, and gets tucked in by Deli and Rosina in her big comfy bed. They close the canopy curtain, leaving mine alone in the dark, and she's already homesick because there's a strict barrier between her and her attendants. And the next morning, mine learns that she can't get up by herself. Yeah, her attendants have to get her up, meaning she has to fake being asleep until breakfast is ready. While practicing Harspiel, Fran delivers her letter and gives Ferdinand a summary of the situation. He orders Mine to stay in her room until he investigates himself. Pretty depressing. She's stuck in not just the temple, but her chambers exclusively. She can't even go to the orphanage or workshop. After practice, she teaches Deli a bit, gets complimented on how good of a teacher she is, and thinks maybe she'll be the one teaching the orphans over winter. But that's shut down because that works beneath her. They'll leave the teaching to the former attendant Grey Ropes. After lunch, Lutz visits, and Mine throws herself at him in a hug because she really misses physical contact. And, uh, sorry to anybody who ships these two, but Lutz is pretty much family to her. After she recharges a bit, Lutz tells her that the workshop has nothing to do, so he asks if they should start doing their handiwork. Now that sounds like a plan, so she has Lutz and Gil fetch boards so that she can explain what they're doing. While Mine explains the cards, Gil notices that the suits look like divine instruments. The spade and diamond look like the staff and spear, the gods of water and fire. So they change the other two into a circle for a shield and an upside down triangle for a chalice. That way they cover the goddesses of wind and earth. The jack becomes a sword for the god of life, the queen and king are the god of light and dark, and the joker becomes the goddess of chaos, who twisted the god of life's love into jealousy. Why is this important? Because it works religion into math, while also reinforcing the temple's curriculum. Now Lutz has to go, so when he leaves, Mine gets sad, and Gil offhandedly mentions that he wishes that Mine would hug him too. But uh, Fran immediately yells at him for that. That's incredibly inappropriate, which reinforces in Mine's head that these people around her are not and cannot be her family. Three days after Mine started living in the temple, Ferdinand writes her and asks if her robes are done. She summons Lutz, and he says that Corina could have them done in three days as she rushes, so Mine responds with five to give the still very pregnant woman some leeway. And Mine gets a response saying cards that will arrive to inspect them and officially deliver them in seven. So Mine hands the summons over to Lutz, and he notices that she's still clinging to him. She's, uh, really not getting over this whole homesick thing. The day of the meeting comes, and Benno comes to her chambers first with Mark, but not Lutz. She asks where Lutz is, and Benno is having him fetch one of each of the handiwork to show the high priest in Cardstead. Benno wants to gauge their reaction, and Mine thinks they'll go over really well. Which fucking floors Benno that she thinks a few toys will make a big impact on history, but she blasted out paper and printing without a care. Though maybe he's just on edge over this meeting, since it'll be two high-ranking nobles drilling him for info on the Ink Guild, and why they're after Mine. After their meeting, Mine delivers a passable greeting to Cardstead, Benno delivers the ropes to him, and he passes them over to Mine to approve, which she does. After that, Ferdinand commends Benno for his speed, and announces that Cardstead and Daniel, who's present as well, their sentences have been fulfilled. With that, Ferdinand drops a magic tool to block the sound around them, and asks Benno about exactly what he expected them to. We get confirmation that the head of the Ink Guild is a shady dude, and Ferdinand praises Benno for having the forethought to hide mine from him. Cardstep points out that the reason Wolf, the uh, head of the Ink Guild, is being so antagonistic suddenly is probably because they're locked into a magic contract now. Yeah, they're not going to care about their working relationship, they kind of got them where they want them. Magic contracts can't be voided without all parties' consent. Benno mentions the importance of keeping Mine away from a dude like that, because she's not just valuable, but tells Cardstead that she'll die at the drop of a hat because that's just how weak she is. As the pieces fall into place, Ferdinand theorizes that a noble may have contracted Wolf to steal Mine for them, so they could claim her as their daughter the whole time, or rescue her to make her in debt to them. The nobles in the room want to know how to control her, but Benno doesn't have any ideas besides constant supervision. So being told to report everything she does for the millionth time, 
Mime brings out her handiwork to show them the new inventions for approval. The games go over pretty well, but Chess Strikes Cardstead is similar to a noble game called Gwenin. That requires mana to play though, so honestly it might do well with lay nobles. After that, Benno takes his leave, but Daniel sits down in his place. This confuses Mime because she thinks she needs to move being lower in status, but they affirm her place. Daniel's punishment is now being fulfilled by order of the Archduke. Ferdinand takes this time to inform Mine of everyone else's punishment. Cardstead's pay was docked for three months, he had to fork out a quarter of Mine's robe cost, and he needs to train the knights better. Jeeks have probably got the short end of this stick, he was fucking executed, and typically his entire family would be killed along with him for disobeying orders. But Mine's a commoner, and that would piss off a ton of nobles. Plus, I'm sure the mana shortage and Veronica had something to do with it. Yeah, noble politics are really fucking confusing. So under a magic contract, his father had to promise to not involve himself with mine, and Sheik's death was officially reported as an honorable death in battle, serving the Knight's Order. We learn that Sheik's mom is a scornful bitch who was pissed that her son was in the temple in the first place, and him coming back to noble society due to the sovereignty purge was a dream come true for her. Now that mine got him killed, yeah, she wants mine to suffer. Now Damiel probably has the most interesting punishment of all, as he too would have been killed if not for mine's defense of him. Also, uh, being a lay noble, his entire family for sure would have been killed. Yeah, I bet Gustav wouldn't have been happy. But the main takeaway here is that mine is in danger, hence why Damiel is assigned to be her guard. Why is that? Because she's an unsigned devouring child with a ton of value to be exploited, and there's not a single arch noble out there who hasn't heard of her yet at least in Ehrenfest. With things so dire and moving around them on the noble side of the wall, Ferdinand tells Mine he originally planned for her to wed into a noble family, but that's not the case anymore. Cardstead asks if she would be willing to be adopted by him, but Mine loses it with all her pent-up homesickness. Not that Cardstead's a bad guy, but the thought of never being able to see her friends and family in the lower city, her mana explodes, and Ferdinand has to pull her into the hidden room and suck her mana out with face stones. He chides her for not dedicating, but she hasn't even been able to leave her room for, like, over a week now? Mine just won't calm down. So Ferdinand resorts to the unthinkable. He wraps his arms around her in a tight hug, just like she did to him in the last volume, saying hugs make her feel better when she's down. She blames all this homesickness on him for digging up all those memories, and showing her how rotten of a daughter she had been as Urano, making her cherish the family she has now. But after she finally calms down, Ferdinand lays it out for her, that she simply can't be ignored due to her mana. She will have to join noble society at some point, and he tells her the latest he can push that back is the age of 10. Once she's 10, she will be adopted by Cardstead and go off to the Royal Academy. So with that, Mine's daily life in the temple returned to normal somewhat. With Daniel guarding her, she could go outside her room again, but she asks to borrow books from the book room since it's cold as hell in there. No one wants to stand around and watch her read, and with her health, yeah, that's not gonna end well. We find out that Ferdinand has taken a liking to Reversi after Mine kicked his ass the first time they played, but now that he knows the strategy, he's beating her regularly. Daniel meets Tully and Lutz, who think he's fucking awesome for being in the Knight's Order, though, uh, he's personally not that great with kids, as he only has an older brother, though he is impressed that Mine is helping out Ferdinand, saying he only gives work to those who can handle it, as long as they try. Hence why he has no tolerance for those who can't do the work he gives them. The gang all head down to the orphanage where Wilma freaks out silently over Damuel being there, as she's scared that he's there for a flower offering. But Mine and Damuel both assure her. His big thing is seeing the kids play with Karuda playing cards and read the Bibles. Essentially, these orphans are getting a better education than lay noble children. Gil gets the orphanage workshop prepped for Peru processing, and on a clear day, all the kids head out to get some led by Gunther, Lutz, and Tuli. Mine has Rosina tell Wilma to get the workshop ready for the influx of Perus. And when Mine's done helping Ferdinand, she eats lunch while Damiel eats with Ferdinand. The fruits come, and when Damiel gets back, they make some Peru cakes, which makes him go crazy that commoners eat something so sweet and delicious. At a later point, Mine and Ferdinand are playing Reversi when he mentions the dedication ritual is beginning later that week. The weird thing here is he instructs Mine to do a poor job, as he previously told the High Bishop Mine can fill 12 small face stones with 8 worths remaining. He knows the Bishop will assume Mine would collapse after offering more than that, but she can actually offer way more. Basically, Ferdinand wants to lie to him so that way if he is confronted about lying, he can boldly claim that he did, rather than being misunderstood. Yeah, Ferdinand has a bit of a petty streak, where he doesn't want to look like he isn't a master puppeteer, 
even though he almost always is. So it comes time for the ritual, Delia gets mine ready, and she walks to Ferdinand's chambers with Fran. She's instructed to wait there until summoned. She feels awkward sitting while Damuel, a noble, is standing, but he assures her it's his job to be on guard in case she's attacked. After a bit, Arno, Ferdinand's head attendant, comes to get mine. He walks a bit fast, but mine asks him to slow down, and he does. But right outside the ritual chambers, which are on the other side of the bishop's chambers, she catches sight of the high bishop leaving the ritual. He walks towards mine because his chambers are behind her, so she kneels off to the side and the bishop scoffs at her. But that's it. Once he's gone, mine, Arno, and Fran all stand up and head to the ritual. You know, I should probably mention this, Arno has this weird habit of doing things that cause minor problems for mine. He first proposed Gil as her attendant, suggested mine take the orphanage director's chambers, spread mine's commoner heritage among the gray robes, stopped Fran from protecting mine during the Trombe extermination, and now brings mine so she just so happens to bump into the high bishop, the person she's trying to avoid. You know, it's just a little too much to be coincidence, and uh, this is Ferdinand's head attendant. He's not gonna make mistakes. Though honestly, while mine's the one getting inconvenienced, Fran's the one who's actually suffering here. He's the one who had to train Gil, go to the orphanage director's chambers despite how uncomfortable it made him, and also see his master get hurt. Now this'll all get elaborated on later because there's a reason for it, but just keep it in the back of your mind for now. I'm just bringing your attention to these things because not just is it subtle, mine's not the type of person who's gonna pay attention to these, but it's really good storytelling in hindsight. Once there, Damuel has to wait outside, while Ferdinand is surprised she came so soon. She notices it's just him there, and no other blue robes. So Ferdinand explains that when offering mana, it creates this title effect that drains more mana when more people are involved, and those who are high in mana pull more from those with less mana, which as we know could cause some harm, meaning Ferdinand is the only one who's mana rich enough to offer with mine. So they kneel and place their hands on a red cloth draped across an altar with the divine instruments and pray. Their mana flows through the cloth and into a chalice at the top. After a bit they stop, and that's pretty much the ritual. Rinse and repeat. Which they do. Ferdinand starts bringing out smaller chalices which are from landowning nobles called Gebs, and this is what would have taken Ferdinand all winter. Filling those. And the extra that seem to keep showing up? Yeah, those are from a neighboring duchy as a political favor. A uh, friend bell tag, which was mentioned in volume 2 of Karina's side story. That's where Oto's parents live. Aaronfest and friend bell tag are close politically for reasons we'll learn about, but the mana shortage hit them harder because they were on the losing side of this purge, and it falls to Aaronfest's temple to help them out in scoring some political points. But right as they're about done, the high bishop shows up again and drops off some more chalices. He says they were requested by the Archduke personally, but Ferdinand hadn't heard of such a request. But the High Bishop has a trick up his sleeve. You see, this isn't a request for Ferdinand, but for mine. So he tells mine to listen and do her job before piecing out of this story until the next volume. Not like we'd seen him since volume 4 anyway. After the ritual, Rosina comes of age. Probably because it's the end of winter already and baptisms and coming of age? Those are the bookends for the seasons. So she's finally 15 and it's brought to Mine's attention by Fran because Mine is the type of person to give her attendants gifts. Plus, uh, it's not uncommon for blue robes to give their attendants gifts when they come of age, so Mine plans to, but she realizes she doesn't know what's appropriate. Fran was touched when he received a pen and ink from Ferdinand when he came of age, as it felt like he was finally recognized by him, and that makes Mine realize she didn't give her attendants gifts for their belated baptisms, and Fran and Wilma's coming of age. They tell her that's not needed, and it's Rosina's big day, not theirs. Plus, mine wanting to give baptism gifts to all the kids in the orphanage won't fly. You know, because of that whole inequality thing again? The ones who didn't get it'll be pissed off. So she asks Ferdinand what to give, and muses aloud about an instrument, which she snaps at her because she doesn't even own one herself. Yeah, that's also just like, unreasonably expensive for an attendant. It's also kinda sad too that the pen may have meant a lot to Fran, but uh, for Ferdinand, it's just a standard gift he gives their attendants when they come of age. Ouch. But talking with Wilma later reveals the perfect present, sheet music. And mine has just the cheat code for this, with earth music lodged in her brain. So she asks Ferdinand to teach her how to write music, and he agrees to. But it takes her so long that he gets frustrated. He gets a harsh spiel, and commands mine to hum the songs so he can compose them. Eventually they cram out four songs and she copies them down as a gift, which of course makes Rosina well up with tears. So coming of age is when someone's officially an adult in this country. Women can finally expose their whole necks, my how scandalous, 
and they're expected to wear full skirts. Now orphans get the short end of the celebratory stick here, as they have their ceremony before the commoners do, and right after they're shoved back into the orphanage. So Rosina's finally an adult at the tender age of 15. Sorry, just need to stick in a reminder that this is a fantasy world with a low level of technology, high infant mortality, and zero retirement age. When parents are too old to work, their children take care of them until they die. Or they just die. God damn, adulthood comes quick. Now it's technically spring, until he brings mine rum talk. A discussion about shoes comes up because mine needs some nice fancy ones for the upcoming spring prayer to look appropriate with Ferdinand. And she also introduces sweet crepes with whipped cream and fruit, despite that concept being similar to commoner street food. But the main feature is mine's metal letter types are complete and ready for her inspection. Benno informs her after the shoemaker leaves, and he wants her to either come to his store or get permission for Johan and his foreman to come to the temple, which means it's time to ask the high priest. So she sets up a meeting, and he says go to Benno's, because Johan doesn't know she's a shrine maiden. The shoemaker was okay because he didn't know mine personally. This is all part of keeping people unsure of who she is. You know, for her safety. She's told to take a carriage there to avoid outside contact because her life is still in danger. So Damuel, Frank, Gil, and mine all end up in Benno's office, with Johan and his foreman to inspect the type. Understand, this went from some quirky girl who gave detailed instructions, to someone arriving by carriage, escorted by a knight, and given the red carpet treatment for Johan. So yeah, he's incredibly nervous, all on top of presenting an order to his patron. So he hands it over. And mine loses her goddamn mind more than any other time in this series. She literally looks like a love-struck girl as she looks over the pieces, sees they're absolutely perfect, and blurts out how this is revolutionary, as this is the second coming of Gutenberg. She then grants that name as a title to Johan, having become the father of printing, but realizes that Lutz and Benno have also helped out getting printing started, and grants them the title too. All before she gets so excited, she passes out causing Damuel to get scared out of his mind having failure to perform duty flash before his eyes while imagining his own execution. But Frangil, Lutz, and Benno tell him and Johan that this is entirely normal, so they put the unconscious mine on a bench. When mine comes to at the temple, she's lectured by literally everyone, now including Damuel, and she gets the feeling that as time goes on, she'll accumulate people who will scold her when she goes overboard. She apologizes to Damuel in a sorry for the trouble but not sorry enough to change sort of way, which pretty much defines her relationship with her retainers moving forward. She gets a letter from Ferdinand shortly after, and right about the time she's assuming it's getting close to her being able to go home. So she goes to his chambers the next day to talk with cookies that he likes. He uses this opportunity to demonstrate how nobles host one another, where the one who prepared the food tests it for poison by taking a demonstrative bite for everyone else. So mine takes the first bite of her cookies while Ferdinand takes the first sip of tea, and she wastes no time by asking about going home and he gives her the very simple answer of no, before pulling her into the hidden room to elaborate more. He explains that he can't let her go home yet because Wolf died. Mine doesn't remember who that is because, well, she's mine. So Ferdinand explains it's the head of the Ink Guild who is targeting her, probably killed for failing to produce results. It's pretty obvious by now that she's being targeted by several nobles, so she needs to tread carefully and not tell anyone about Wolf's death or her possible adoption by Cardstead especially Delia. When mine goes back to her chambers, she calls Lutz from the workshop, passes along the letter of invitation to her mom and dad from Ferdinand, and is pretty much stuck there until spring prayer is over. Yeah, a small bit of kindness here, as you're probably wondering how mine will survive without food as she only prepped enough for her winter stay, Ferdinand gifted her some while she was sick, showing he thought about that very thing. So mine's parents come, and she can't really act familiar with them because she's a blue shrine maiden, and these aren't her chambers. They go to Ferdinand's room, and after tea is served, he clears the room out, puts down a sound-blocking magic tool, and lets mine sit with her family, showing again that he's actually a really nice dude. Ferdinand is also sort of buttering mine and her family up with that kindness, and sincerely apologizes that she'll have to stay through spring prayer. Now, they're understandably upset about this, as this isn't what they agreed upon, but he tells them not to speak of their conversation to anyone. Mine has more mana than they expected. Nobles are targeting her, and their biggest concern is her being taken from the city or duchy, where someone could simply claim her as their child this whole time and they wouldn't have any recourse. The Archduke is already on the move, changing the rules for nobles entering the city, which Gunther is aware of and now understands more. Though none of this would be necessary if she would just agree to the adoption, 
and Ferdinand asks her parents about it. They refuse, and of course, Ferdinand gets a bit of a chuckle, realizing they're just like mine. However, after Effa learns that mine could be executed if she doesn't learn to control her mana, and with Ferdinand's promise, she says they'll entrust mine to him when she turns 10, because she knows they can't keep their daughter safe. As sad as that is. So with that all decided, spring is here, and mine thinks about how to make a printing press. She explains how they work to LUTs, and ultimately decide to modify a press they already have. They don't really have to complicate things by building a true Gutenberg press just yet, when all they really need is a press, a thing to hold the letters, a roller, and ink. Gil tells Mine that she should head back to her chambers rather than talking to LUTs, because Rosina is low-key pissed off that Mine isn't in her chambers watching them pack. So she heads back there and sees a smiling Rosina masking her frustration. As silly as it is, Mine's job is to sit there and watch. Rosina asks offhandedly if they can take the Harspiel, but it's the High Priest. So Mine asks when she sees him, and he gives permission, despite Mine expecting him not to. Mine's also worried about getting sick, but Ferdinand's prepared for that too, by making a big batch of those nasty-ass potions. Though, uh, he improved the flavor at least. Also, remember back in Volume 4 when Lutz's parents were against him traveling for fear of bandits? Mine asks about that, and Ferdinand tells her no bandits would be stupid enough to attack a traveling priest. Because they're not a group of dedicated criminals, like Mine thought, but farmers on hard times who are looking forward to the spring prayer. Also, that's a quick way to get a village wiped off the map. But on the day they're supposed to leave for spring prayer, Ferdinand tells Mine to go to his room, because plans have changed. They're going to be accompanied by another blue robe priest. Cue Cardstead entering the room, as well as an unfamiliar blue robe. Not that mine's familiar with any blue robes besides Ferdinand, but this one's young, and judging by how he acts, is of incredibly high status. His name is Sylvester, and he's incredibly close to Ferdinand and Cardstead. He teases mine by poking her cheek and telling her to chirp pooey, which is apparently the sound shoe mills make. Yeah, uh. Mine sort of reminds people of a shoe mill because of her hair and eye color, as well as her short stature. Yeah. While Sylvester is tormenting her, Cardstead and Ferdinand are looking over a map confirming their route. When he pulls her hair stick out, Mine's scared that he'll break it, so she loses her temper, grabbing Ferdinand and Cardstead's attention. They smack Sylvester and tell him to tease Damuel instead, who's been frozen in terror upon seeing Sylvester this whole time. This forever cements Sylvester as a grade school boy in Mine's eyes because he acts like one. When they all set off, carriages are ditched to go solo with the attendants, and they go by High Beast instead. Mine's with Damuel while Sylvester rides with Ferdinand, and Cardstead leads the way. Mine makes her annoyance at Sylvester pretty known, despite everyone assuring her he's actually a pretty good guy deep down, and he remarks that she's cold to him. But he's not alone in that. She's quite annoyed at Damuel too, because despite him being her guard, he didn't protect her from Sylvester at all. And before he gets his reason out why, he shuts up and apologizes, hinting at what anybody with two eyes can figure out, that Sylvester's not just a normal blue robe, though she does secure some points with Cardstep. By asking if Sylvester demands some unreasonable things from her, can she go running to him for safety, as her future father, which clearly tugs at his heartstrings. So the convoy lands in a massive gathering of commoners at a town, they pull out a big chalice, Mine touches it, fills it with mana, and they pour that into buckets for the surrounding village chiefs. With that done, they go off to the next. Rinse, repeat, off to the next town for about four total before they set down for the night, staying at a summer mansion of a noble, uh, specifically Baron Blonde, one we've heard mentioned a few times. They all eat dinner together, where Mine gets passing marks from everyone on her appearance, but Sylvester is very interested in her food, as it looks nothing like theirs. He asks to have some, and Mine says that he can have half of hers, which he finds weird. Eh, couldn't have been that weird. He does eat it. Turns out when a noble of higher status shows interest in your food, you're meant to give them your plate, and they'll eat as much as they want before passing it back. After dinner, Mine tries to take her leave, but she's not getting away that easily. Sylvester tells her to stick around, and she's not high enough status to refuse. He wants to trade chefs, but she's adamant that she can't because Hugo isn't her chef. He accepts that Benno probably couldn't refuse his request to trade, so he gives up there, showing Mine that he does have a good heart deep down. She explains the restaurant, which Sylvester gets invited to when it opens, along with Cardstead and Ferdinand. So Ferdinand has Mine bring Rosina to play Harspiel, and everyone is quite impressed. Sylvester tells Mine to play next, because a grey shrine maiden was so talented with Ferdinand praising her. Certainly Mine could pull that off too, right? Well, unfortunately there's one problem. She can't play because she can't use an adult-sized instrument. 
but Rosina chucks mine right back under that bus she finally crawled out from last volume by fetching the child-sized hearse peel she packed. However, in the meantime, Ferdinand plays. Mine suggests card step play as well, but he's not that great at the hearse peel. But uh, apparently he's pretty good at the flute. That does start to worry mine though, that if a big strong guy like Cardstead is musically inclined, she's fucked. He instead grabs Daniel for a sword dance, which is incredible according to mine as she lavishes him with praise. Sylvester jumps up and does a more technically impressive dance and strikes a pose after, but mine's less than enthusiastic at the end because he's fishing for compliments from her. Don't really know why he wants to impress her so bad, but sure. Her playing of the heart spiel only gets her not bad from the crowd, showing she has a long way to go yet. After that though, she fakes being sick so she can head to bed for some rest. The next morning they leave after Ferdinand greets the noble proper, and hands over his small chalice for the dedication ritual. Mine wonders why the landowning nobles don't do their own rituals, but keeps that to herself. But once Ferdinand is back, they head off for another round of towns, repeat this process for four total days, and then they just have noble houses to visit. Now sometimes they fake like they've been riding in carriages the whole time, and mine has to wear a veil that's apparently popular among noble daughters, so that she can hide her face to keep nobles from recognizing her. But in all, there's obviously something up here. They stop by Vice Count Gerlach's place who requested to see mine personally, but uh, for this one, they're definitely keeping her face hidden. The reason being, Ferdinand warns that he's close to the High Bishop. Cardstead and Sylvester never leave their carriages either. They leave after a short meeting, because they're staying at Count Lies Gang's mansion that night. It takes a while to get to that mansion, but the next day at breakfast, Ferdinand informs Mine the reason they're having her stay in the servants' quarters. And it's not because she's a commoner like they thought. It's because Cardstead was attacked the previous night by brigands. He and Sylvester tried to catch the culprits, but they either exploded or died mysteriously, leaving no clues who sent them. Mine asks if it was Lies Gang, but Cardstead shoots that down, because, uh, they're his family, where Gerlach had motives and knew where they were going. After breakfast, they leave by High Beast, but let the carriages go first so they don't beat them to the next mansion. En route, they see a signal flare, letting them know the carriages are under attack. Mine sees a black mist around where Fran and Rosina are, which makes her lose her mind. It also indicates that a noble's there, as the black mist is an attack to absorb mana. A bunch of armed people rush out of the forest at the carriages, and Mime freaks out more. She wants those people dead for hurting those close to her, but Sylvester doesn't want to because those could be their duchy citizens. Now Mime doesn't give a single shit about this, and pours a metric ton of mana into her ring. Everyone yells at her to stop, but it's too late. She confirms that all she needs to do is pray to the gods to do magic. Sylvester tells Ferdinand to stop her somehow, or at least buy them some time for him to reinforce the border barrier. I don't know how many clues you need to figure out who Sylvester is, but fuck if it isn't obvious. So Ferdinand instead redirects mine. He tells her to pray to shoot Zarya, the goddess of wind who's known for protection magic. She sculpts a shield around the carriages with Ferdinand telling her to make sure it doesn't touch the black mist. And hey, that works. Her rampage is successfully diverted. The attacking men are deflected by strong gusts of wind. But Damiel speaks up, saying that he can sense mana in the forest, meaning that's where the noble is pulling the strings from. Ferdinand, Sylvester, and Cardstead are about to go under Ferdinand's orders, but Sylvester throws mine off Damiel's high beast, telling Ferdinand to catch her. He just overrided the high priest right there, and has Damiel go because he can sense the mana, where the higher mana trio can't. Ferdinand realizes that was the right call after catching mine, and asks her to pray for their safety. They pray to the god of war, and suddenly Cardstead launches a massive attack that vaporizes the forest, where Sylvester creates this bird looking thing to strengthen the border barrier. That way the attack is contained within Arenfest. Otherwise that could have started a war. With everything clear, they check on the carriages. It turns out everyone's safe. Mine passes out from being out of mana, which is weird, but then again, she did use a lot. Ferdinand promises to make her drink one of his nasty potions, and while they wait for her to recover, he scolds her something fierce. He confirms that those attacking were mostly not from their duchy, but the main thing is, he asks why she let herself lose control again. She was lucky she had a magic tool and could activate a spell and redirect it in a way that saved people's lives. You know, not into an attack. She just marked herself as a threat for sure again, right in front of Cardstead, the commander of the Knight's Order, and uh, redacted for spoilers. So as punishment, he tells her exactly what happens to those who lose control of their mana, and how horrible of a death they have. 
After spring prayer, Mine is greeted by her attendants upon returning, her stuff is taken back to her chambers, and she gets an urgent call from Ferdinand about returning home. In his office, she's surprised to see Sylvester there, and it turns out he's the one who called. He says he doesn't know much about the temple and tells Mine to be his guide. He wants to see the orphanage, the workshop, and the forest the kids are going in to gather. Now why does he want to do that? To hunt, of course. Mine protests, but Ferdinand washes his hands of the situation by saying he'll accompany Sylvester to the orphanage and workshop, mostly because he's been meaning to go see them himself. Mine wants to know about going home, but since she expelled a ton of mana, he says that if she isn't sick in the next three days, she can go home on the 4th. So they get kicked out, and Sylvester walks Mine to his room, which is apparently right next to Ferdinand's. It's, uh, pretty much empty, telling the audience quite a bit there, but Mine doesn't quite get the hint. He bitches about the noble quarter forest being boring and full of suck-ups, and he just wants to hunt freely. That's why he wants to go to the commoner forest. So Mine schedules the orphanage visit for two days from now, and has Lutz get some adult-sized secondhand clothes for Sylvester. She also tells him to inform Benno, so he can get a connection with the new blue robe priest who's interested in the workshop and restaurant. Also, uh, inform her parents that if she isn't sick by the fourth day, she can go back home. The day of the visit comes, and Gil is trying to be better at formal speech, so Mine doesn't replace him, paying off on Volume 4's side story. Benno arrives and asks Mine if she knows anything about Sylvester's family, and of course she doesn't, so Benno just resigns himself to her being stupid, and accepts the opportunity for a new noble connection before heading off to the workshop. She heads to Ferdinand's chambers, gives Sylvester the secondhand clothes, and they head off, which is Fran and Damiel as their entourage. In the orphanage, Wilma holds it together meeting two blue robe priests, which are basically her phobia, and Mine demonstrates the kids learning through games and such. Sylvester's pretty impressed. He congratulates the winning kid, showing again that he's got a good heart, but he and Ferdinand confirm that the kids can read, and pretty much learn to do so over winter. They see the kitchen, where Sylvester protests about the orphans eating so well, because that food tastes way too good for them, he thinks, and even gets annoyed at Daniel for getting sweets during his punishment. But Mine has to drag everyone over to the workshop. It's about this time Benno has a heart attack upon seeing Sylvester for the first time, who drags the poor guy outside while Ferdinand witnesses printing firsthand. He's visibly shaken at the printing press under development when a quick demonstration happens, so he tells Mine they have much to discuss, meaning she's in for a pretty big lecture. Benno comes back from his discussion with Sylvester looking quite pale, and after the tour he wants to yell at Mine, but he's too exhausted to, and can't even discuss what he wants to yell at her about because Sylvester told him not to. She gets a letter from Sylvester and Ferdinand, the latter inviting her to the lecture room, and the former ordering her to take him to the forest the next day, when she's there first thing in the morning, dressed in those nasty secondhand clothes. When he comes back from a very successful hunting trip with some awestruck orphans calling him Brother Sill, he gifts the fruits of his hunt to the orphanage. He then gives Mine a small protection charm, saying he won't be around for a while, but she needs to keep this magic tool necklace on her at all times. It won't cast spells when prayed to, or even if she pours man into it, but if she's ever in trouble, press her blood to it and he'll come save her. She doesn't quite understand, but she accepts it anyway. In the hidden room, Ferdinand asks Mine some pointed questions about how history was changed after printing was introduced in her old world. She explains it pretty much killed the copying profession. The proliferation of information brought down systems of nobility worldwide, and misinformation also cropped up quite regularly, while also debating a bit about why the nobility can't be disbanded in their world, which Mine understands, as nobles do a lot for that world though she does think they do need to work on their image campaign in the lower city, as they have pretty much no clue that nobles keep farms running. He tells her not to go forward with the printing press until she turns 10. Now she's sad, but hey, at least she can still use stencils, right? After that, Gunther picks her up, and they can head home for a home-cooked meal, where mine can actually help. Or fail to, rather. We find out that Effa is super close to giving birth, and they go to bed that night quite happy, but Mime wakes up the next morning to her mom in labor. Tuli races out to go get Carla, Gunther gets the midwife, and Mime watches after her mom. Birth sucks in this time period, so her first instinct is to wipe everything down with alcohol and get people to wash their hands. When she sees a nasty, bloody birthing bench, she tries to wipe it down and tells everyone to wash their hands before helping her mom give birth. And after they do wash up at Mime's insistence, because everyone calls her a clean freak, she's kicked out with her dad, so that he can go grill some birds, as is tradition in this world. Women help each other give birth, and the men cook for themselves to reward the women with a meal when they come out after a successful birth. Lutz hears what's happening and goes to the temple to tell them that Mine won't be there that day, 
and they gift her some of the meat that Sylvester got, which means they can begin prepping a big feast for the naming ceremony. It's an unofficial thing held in the neighborhoods. It's so everyone can remember the kid's face and celebrate their baptism. Very helpful in a world without high literacy. Gunther's just hoping the kid is healthy this time, and this is where we learn why he's such a doting father. Their first pregnancy was a miscarriage. Their next was a boy who didn't make it a year, then Thule and mine, followed by another miscarriage. Yeah, there was a reason he was taking Mine's potential death from the devouring so hard in Volume 3. But the women come out shortly after, and Thule tells them that the kid is doing fine. Mine officially has a baby brother they named Camille. She convinces her family to wash up before handling him, kind of preying on Gunther's insecurities there, but hey, it works. And we get a heartwarming scene where Mine gets to hold him, ending on a happy note. Mine has two short years left to spoil her baby brother and make as many memories as she can with him before she's taken by the nobility. The epilogue foreshadows the coming events, with Delia overhearing about Mine's family celebrating something in the lower city from Fran and Gil. She thinks to herself about how Gil and Rosina are getting new responsibilities in Mine's chambers, while she's not really getting anything, further cementing in her mind just how much she doesn't actually belong there. Once those two leave the room, she decides to report what little she knows to the High Bishop, but he's currently out visiting a Gieb, so she tells the former attendant of Christine about it, who reaffirms Delia's dedication to becoming a mistress by complimenting how much more refined she's become. She tells Delia to polish her beauty because a noble visitor is coming soon, one who's interested in a child. That's fucking gross. Delia races off, hoping she'll be called upon, and maybe even taken by this noble so she won't have to live in the temple anymore, but faintly hears that the noble is looking for a child with the devouring. Well, that left us on a hell of a cliffhanger, but... We're not done just yet. We got side stories to cover first, and this book shares quite a bit about the sporting cast. In lunchtime in the temple, we learn more about our favorite sad sack, Damuel. He's been in the temple for a while now, pretty much a whole season, and Ferdinand has taken pity on him by inviting him to lunch, since Mine can't feed him. He shows Ferdinand a list of questions Mine has for him, all relating to archaic language found in the Bible so she can read older versions of it, but Damuel couldn't help her, and finds her luster books, uh, quite off-putting actually, probably because it's not normal for a just-baptized child to be interested in books like that, and also bothers him a little bit that he's less knowledgeable than a commoner, but laments his lot in life to Ferdinand who's willing to listen. He claims it was all bad luck that led to his current situation, but Ferdinand points out to him that he isn't even aware of his sin. When Sheiksa attacked mine, Damuel just shut up and accepted his lower status as an excuse without enacting his duty. He should have used a spell to call for help from the Knight's Order to stop Sheiksa. He was inherently looking down on mine because she's a commoner, which prevented him from doing his duty. Turns out Damuel also had to borrow money from his brother to pay his debt, which is straining their family too, so Ferdinand throws him a bone. Since he's making apprentice pay and can't copy books for students in the Royal Academy anymore, and offers to let Damuel do some paperwork in the temple for a fair wage. He accepts, and uh, that's that. I like this look at Daniel's motivations, and how the inferiority complex of lay nobles frames his actions so perfectly. And it doesn't make him, like, a bad guy, it just shows his inherent biases. In fact, I think it actually makes him a more interesting character, knowing this about him. So yeah, this is a good side story. In our next side story, we see the whole metal letter type thing from Johan's perspective, where he confirms mine looked like a love-struck girl staring at them, his shock over her passing out, and how nervous he really was. After she did pass out, we get some seriousness from Benno, as he flat out says this will revolutionize the world. Mine wasn't exaggerating about that, and Benno recognized it. She just created something insane, and everyone understands that except Johan. Benno basically tells him he's now wrapped up in this, and he's not getting away from Mine so easily. Also, uh, he wants to escape the title of Gutenberg, but everyone tells him to wear it proudly as that's a huge status symbol for a craftsman. His foreman teases him about it, but solidly backs him as they go to the guild for evaluation. He explains what he had to do and passes with flying colors, as they recognize how technically impressive the precision in these pieces are. Also, we're introduced to another smith named Zack, who's Johan's self-proclaimed rival. He's a cocky kid who's incredibly imaginative, but not as technically skilled as Johan hinting at how those two could work well together if they weren't from different shops. Also, if they got along better, but, you know, whatever. When he reports how his evaluation went to Benno, he's pleased, and hands over another order from mine to Johan. Yeah, she wants more letters and symbols. This motherfucker's really gonna be stuck as a Gutenberg his whole life. Well, this is awkward. 
I don't have anything to compare this to yet because season three's not out, at least when this video was made, so don't hold that against me. I guess the best I can do is summarize my thoughts on it and point out some of the cooler stuff. The last two books in part two really blurred together for me on my initial read, probably because part three looms so large on the horizon, but rereading through this volume in particular, and at the time, the most current volume in part four, there's a lot of setup and foreshadowing in this book that carry consequences for the rest of the series. It's very obvious who Sylvester is in hindsight, and the book doesn't really hide it well on the initial read, but the subtleties in how he interacts with people? This lays the foundation with him in mind for the rest of their relationship moving forward. It also gives a slight glimpse of how he and Ferdinand's dynamic works, which builds so organically off this little time we spent with him as a character in this volume. Hell, I think the Noble cast is exactly what this series needed at this time. From what we knew about nobles to this point, we knew the blue robe priest who looked down on mine, the high bishop who hated her, but Ferdinand seemed like an exception. Seeing Cardstead, who's got a soft spot for her, and is completely willing to open up his house for her at the mere request of Ferdinand, Sylvester being so friendly with non-noble children, and Daniel willing to meet with and engage with commoners on an interpersonal level, demonstrates how nobles aren't this scary, menacing force we were led to believe early on in this story. They have shades, with good, bad, and goofy, and portraying them all in different ways. And that's a great subversion, because it shows the author cared about them as characters. And considering how big of a role these people are going to play moving forward, saying, hey, you know these people we've been talking about like they could end us all with a thought? Turns out they're people too, and you're going to like them. It's just nice so much personality was injected early on. This is where the magic system really starts to get defined in this book. It's not just pouring this nebulous substance that you have in your body into a tool and suddenly it works, but the prayers and incantations that initially seem like, oh, that's just how magic is performed, really have some surprisingly deep roots in this world. Praying is like an archaic form of spellcasting to nobles, so the color of spells, how they relate to the divine color and the gods invoked, it all interrelates to show a lot of thought was put into making this stuff work, having it all make sense to the audience, and fit thematically. The more we learn about the religion and how intertwined it is with magic, but also how nobles view that religion, is a really interesting dynamic I wish the series put a stronger focus on. But it does still get attention, don't get me wrong. It's just drip-fed over the next 10 volumes or so. Mine's clueless perspective on the things happening around her feels like a mystery unraveling on the first read of this. A noble is behind the ink guild, and when Ferdinand starts investigating, the head is killed off. But that's like, the lowest level. We don't know how deep this goes until like, part 3, and even part 4 for some of the finer details. Faction politics we learn about later on, with Veronica's faction, a minor ragtag faction of some outcast nobles, Ferdinand's expulsion from noble society, and how those spill into the temple shows that mine's just a stepping stone here. She's the current rope in this game of tug of war. Yeah, she's a thorn in Bezewan's side, and Sheiks' mother being the impetus to get the nobles invested sets this cascade into motion, and mine's initially the target, but not an active participant in this stuff especially as this conflict comes to a head, as we'll see in the next volume just how involved everything is. So that's pretty much it. Mine's finally finished her obligations to the temple, and is now just playing the waiting game to really kick printing into gear. But there's just one problem. The background forces are on the move. Will she be able to maintain her life as a Shrine Maiden? Or will the nobles targeting her force the hands of those trying to protect mine? We'll just have to find that out in the next video, where we'll finally conclude the events of Part 2, Apprentice Shrine Maiden. But for now, hey, you've made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with a link down in the description, and if you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks, like voting on what I do next. Thanks for watching.